Good morning, physics to students, uh, or at least, and, and it's morning for me, so I don't know when you're watching this video. Uh, anyway, the point is we're trying to finish in here to uh, chapter 27. This is probably the recording before last, depending on how long it goes, uh, for, uh, the, uh, for chapter 27. Uh, we talked already about few topics as well as this chapter. We have two more to continue to, continue to talk about. So let me introduce this uh, ideas quickly here. Since, uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about is actually uh, the magnetic flux. But before I do that, there are some internet studies from last time, namely the motion uh, of the charge inside the magnetic field where the charge has a component of velocity that is parallel to the uh, magnetic uh, field. And also, we're going to talk uh, about the velocity selector and JJ's experiment, uh, JJ Thompson's experiment on uh, determining the ratio of the charge over the mass of an electron. And uh, in terms of uh, homework and problems related to uh, the exam and things like that, these two topics, the magnetic flux in general and the magnetic flux or the equivalent of Gauss's law for magnetism, we're going to talk about that. And finally, and actually it's of extreme importance, we're going to talk about also a magnetic force on a wire with a current uh, running through it, and also the current loop, which is of uh, extreme importance, it's going to be related to motors in general. And we may have a project, depending on how much resources we're going to have, uh, to see if we can uh, develop a project for this topic anyway. So uh, before I do that, let me go into quickly the uh, what we discovered so far in this chapter. We discovered that F is equal to Q V cross B, namely this was a law that was based on experiment, and this is Lorentz force, okay? We discovered that this force is given by the right-hand rule. If the charge is positive, it exactly follows where the direction of the right-hand rule points. And if uh, the uh, charge is negative, of course, you're going to reverse that direction because Q is an algebraic value in here. Uh, we saw also that if I have a charge moving in a direction perpendicular to the magnetic field, then uh, this cross product will simply be, uh, when I take its magnitude, is just the product of the charge times B times D. And this number will be equal to if uh, Q is positive, otherwise I'm going to take its absolute value because all I'm interested in and the motion in the direction perpendicular to the velocity, and that is going to be given by centripetal acceleration. So in other words, we're going to find uh, the radius with which this particle will move. So all I have to do is move off of this direction and move nV to the numerator, so nV over QB. So it's going to go into a circular path whose, uh, whose uh, radius is given by the ratio of the momentum of the particle over its, uh, its uh, product of its uh, charge times the magnetic field where it resides, where it actually fell in. Now, an interesting application that we talked about also is the, uh, the so-called angular frequency omega c is given by v over r, which is equal to from this expression as the ratio of qb over m. So if I'm going to switch fast enough the polarity of a of a of a of an electric field where the particle can be reoriented by magnetic field in other regions we call them Bs, uh, so that it's going to come back. It's going to come back to this region and be accelerated all the time until it gains tremendous speed. So that was the concept of a cyclotron accelerator, and this is what is known as a cyclotron frequency. So these are the things that we have seen so far in this chapter. Another interesting application of this, of, or at least an uh, application of this law, is the fact that if I have a charge that has a component of velocity initially parallel to the magnetic field. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to do in here, I'm going to uh, take it so that this uh, particle uh, has a uh, uh, both components actually were parallel and perpendicular to the magnetic field. So in this case, in the direction perpendicular, it's still given by this expression, namely Q V perpendicular times B is equal to M times V perpendicular squared over uh, over R. But now, since we cancel the V perpendicular with the V perpendicular squared, this, this expression holds true. In other words, it's going to still continue in a circular path in that direction. However, in the parallel direction, uh, the, the Q 
QV cross B gives you zero, and this must be equal to M times the parallel acceleration. Therefore, if I integrate this one, it's going to be a constant. And since the particle has an initial velocity in this direction, so that constant is actually the initial direction, initial velocity that was parallel to the uh, to the uh, to that direction. So in other words, the v in the parallel direction is going to be equal to whatever initial value that you give it in that in that uh, in that uh, direction. So imagine with me that this is the direction of the magnetic field. It's pointing in this direction. So if a particle started moving, it's going to be moving in this direction. It's a sort of what is called as a helix. So Every period given by the uh, two pi over omega c, and omega c is given by the ratio of uh, v perpendicular over r, so which is going to be e uh, over this number basically, which is q b over m. So it's going to be q b times m. So that's going to be the period that it takes for it to go once around this path. And during that time, the particle would have moved the distance given by uh, V naught, which is the initial velocity times this number. So you can actually find the, all the properties of this uh, motion uh, as, uh, as you can uh, see. So this is part of the homework problems. I really don't want to get into the details a lot in terms of the math, but it's not really that hard to, uh, to do. Anyway. So this has an important uh, at least application in trying to understand what's going on with the northern lights. So because the magnetic field points from south to north, actually in here, because that's how the compass uh, move, uh, shows. So uh, basically, uh, this is the, the geographical north, and this is the geographical south. Namely, this is where the north pole is, magnetic north pole, and this is where the magnetic south pole is. So if a particle comes in in here and it has these components from the solar, this is part of the solar wind. So these are charged particles that are emitted by the sun, alpha particles and other actually charged particles. So they will go into paths that are in this helical motion around the, around the uh, depending on uh, their initial V and depending also on their charge, some of them will go into the northern pole and some of them will uh, go into the southern pole. And of course, they will do so by interacting with the upper uh, upper atmosphere. And actually, those collisions produce the lights that we know as the northern and southern uh, lights, basically, the different kinds of the phenomenon that are associated with the uh, with the uh, solar wind as they hit the atmosphere. So that's something that is quickly in here. I know that we are going to have a little bit of a discussion of these things in the class later on when we meet tomorrow. So this recording actually is on Monday. Uh, it's chosen here 24th, but actually the recording is actually on the 30th of, uh, of, uh, of March. Anyway, uh, so this is some of the applications for, uh, for, uh, for uh, this Lorentz force. Lorentz force is that what we have seen so far, basically. Of course, Lorentz force has two components. One of them is the one due to the, to the charge. Is moving inside the magnetic field, but there is another one actually that is for a uh, uh, for the electric field. So imagine with me the following situation that I'm going to talk about. Also another application of this. So if I have a particle coming in here, let's take its charge to be positive, and it has an initial velocity that is moving in this direction. So if I have this two plates, they're like capacitors connected to some power source somewhere else we don't care at this point for, as long as I have an electric field basically in this region pointing downward. So that's the bottom line here. So in this case, the charge, which I assume to be uh, positive, is going to be subject to this electrostatic force QE. At the same time, if you can think that there is a magnetic field in such a way that is, uh, so in this case in here, because Q is positive and E is positive, the charge will be subject to a force pointing down along the direction of the electric field, pointing down because Q is positive. If Q is negative, then the charge will come up, actually, will go up. So, but we're going to assume that this charge is like protons, for example, coming with extreme high velocity, leaving that accelerator, for example, and as they enter this region, they will come out with velocities as, and they will be bent by the electric field. 
So in the same time, imagine with me that there is actually magnetic fields coming out of this, the, 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 the screen in here. And that magnetic field now will have also another effect. So this is the electrostatic effect. So there is actually a magnetic effect due to the magnetic field given by the expression that we saw up, uh, up there. So what happened in this case is, by the right-hand rule, again, I'm going to go back into the right-hand rule. So we have uh, V is this way, charge is positive, the magnetic field is coming out. So if I follow the right-hand rule and put my finger, my thumb along the, uh, the direction of the V and B in the, the pointer, then the, uh, the last one is going to be pointing down. So there is this force in here, and I'm assuming Q is still positive. It doesn't matter if Q is negative because the total effect that I'm going to talk about doesn't really is going to be charge independent. So in this case, the, the the magnetic force will make it so that it points upward. So this is the effect of the electrostatic force, and this is the effect of the magnetic static force. So both of them will combine to give me a different orientation where the particle needs to be moving. So again, this is F electrostatic. And this is F magnetostatic. Okay. Then the combination of the two is this force, that's basically F will be simply equal to Q times the product of E plus V plus B. I am interested in the following situation the particles that come in and go unimpeded. Not the ones that fall to the negative plate, not the ones that fall to the positive plate, but I'm interested in the particles that don't fall anywhere and continue straight out. The cross beam, sorry. Uh, I'm interested in those particles that come straight out. Those particles would be given by a total force that is equal to zero. So the ones that go down, that means the electrostatic force has won. The ones that go up and in the, the positive plate, those are the ones that the uh, magnetostatic force was too strong for them. I'm not interested in any of those. I'm interested in just the particles in such a way that the total force cancels out so that the particles come unimpeded moving through this combination of electrostatic and magnetostatic fields. Then uh, in that situation, basically what we have in here, we're going to project this forces into the direction of the electric field. So this is going to be my positive direction. So this is going to be positive. This is going to be clearly negative because it's pointing upward. V times B, remember V times B times sine of 90 degrees because this angle is still 90 degrees. So it's going to be sine of uh, 90 degrees is one equals to zero. From here, I'm going to find those particles whose initial velocity is given by the ratio of E over B. So by tweaking E or B or the, both of them together, I can selectively collect charges in here that are moving with specific velocity that is just given, the, given by the ratio of the electrostatic field and the magnetostatic field. So this is one of the applications actually of this law. Namely, this is a velocity selector. So with this device, what you can do is you select velocity, you select velocity. So this is a velocity selector. So that's the purpose of this device. So we have a lot of applications of this law so far, and I think we can, uh, we're ready to move on to other applications, actually to other interesting phenomena. Namely, the next topic is gonna be the flux of the magnetic field, and the main two topics that are gonna be actually the current the current related to current, namely the charge inside the current. I'm sorry, uh, uh, wire with a charge uh, with a current running through it inside the magnetic field, and also current loop, which is all those applications are related to the to the uh, to uh, motors. So I'm going to stop in here this recording, and I'm going to continue it later on because, as I promised, I want to make this recording a little bit short. Thank you.